Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and we are excited to – I don't do a lot of interviews, but uh, I have followed the career of Tom Lobianco for a while since he uh, was an investigative reporter for the AP here in Indiana and uh, was a very good reporter here in town, and I was excited to see him go to C uh, CNN along with Eric Bradner, who was another great reporter from Indiana. And Lobianco has written a book called Piety and Power about Mike Pence, and – with impeachment taking place, I felt it was uh, a good picture of Mike Pence and understanding who he is, and I uh, wanted, wanted to talk to Tom about Mike Pence and uh, the man who may be president if, and which nobody thinks, my, Donald Trump gets removed from <laughs> office. Uh, so I want to welcome Tom Lobianco to the program. Tom, how are you? <laughs> Spangle, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, you are actually in a cool location. You're, where are you? Where am I? I'm in an old missile silo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm in a, actually, not, not too far off, a Cold War era relic. This is an old phone booth from the House Press Gallery that used to sit upside, um, over top the, in the, uh, the Daily Press Gallery, uh, where all the reporters worked in uh, Congress. And um, they removed these about, oh, uh, like five or six years ago. But there used to be, here, I'll do a little tour of my space here. Yeah, and if you can, can see the, that. Check out the video on. Uh, if you can YouTube. see that, and then let me, I'll poke my head out of here. Hold on a second. If you can see across the way there, these are old school videos, or uh, uh, phone booths. And there's an old little, whatever, phone jack up there. So there used to, we used to get phone calls in there. So, uh, but this has now been relocated to the National Press Club, where I do a lot of work. And uh, I'm hanging out in here. It does get hot in here. Uh, believe it or not, there's a, <laughs> It does. You know, I used to get so hot in my, uh, that Indiana state, the, the shack in the basement. Yeah. Cause like, and everybody has fans in the ceiling just over the, the, the drop tiles that we all have, you know, in the old, the old horse stables in the basement. If you, you know, your listeners ever go there um, and, you, and you'll, you'll enter in the, the basement, um, go pop all those little shacks, all those little pop outs are filled with reporters, or at least they're mostly filled with reporters. Yeah, Abdul, when I was uh, working an intern for Abdul, he requested one of those, and uh, it hadn't been cleaned out in 20 years. And so he, for, he stood and he watched <laughs> me clean out his old stable <laughs> in the basement. So I'm very familiar with those. Um, so let's. I, I Shoveling out stables in the basement. Exactly. <laughs> I want to get a. Uh, I want to give people a sense of you because you're part of the enemy of the people. Mm -hmm. Fake news. Um, yes. Where, Proud enemy of the people. Yep. So you worked for AP here in Indiana, and then you went to CNN, and then what do you do now? Like, talk a little bit about your career, just so people get an idea of what you sure. do. Sure. Living. So I did my undergrad in journalism years and years and years ago, uh, and um, worked at the, a couple of small papers here in Maryland. And uh, D.C. is in Maryland, as, uh, as your historians will note, because Maryland it gave up the land for D.C. and Virginia took its portion back. So <laughs> us Marylanders like to remind people, this is Maryland's land. <laughs> um, well, and uh, <laughs> I know we gave you the swamp <laughs> yeah. and we could take it back, too, although I'm not sure we want to. <laughs> no. Um, so I, I went to undergrad at the University of Maryland and um, then I uh, left uh, journalism for a while, went, uh, followed a girl up to uh, Northeast. Uh, she went to Quinnipiac. I went to uh, Northeastern for graduate school, uh, did politics for a hot minute. I uh, volunteered for a guy named Deval Patrick when he ran for uh, governor of Massachusetts. Um, decided that eventually I decided that I hated politics like practicing politics, I should say, the art of keeping a lid on things. I'm not very good at keeping a lid on things. <laughs> and I went back to journalism. <laughs> um, I worked at the Washington Times for three years. I covered the Maryland State House. I covered the climate change bill, Obama's first year in office. I left there, I got laid off, then I left there, worked for an energy publication. Where else did I go? Worked at, uh, went to the AP, worked at the Maryland State House for the AP for a hot minute, then went to Indiana, worked at AP in Indiana, then the Indy Star, uh, came back here to DC, worked at CNN, went back to the AP, and left the AP about a year and a half ago to write this book. Um, so no shortage of jobs there. <laughs> Yeah, so, so what do you do now? I mean, are you a full-time author at this point? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm working on another project right now, uh, freelancing some, uh, some daily reportage. Uh, I'm a contributor at Yahoo News. Uh, wrote a few impeachment uh, items for them. Uh, although I can tell you that the impeachment, uh, I guess, excitement has kind of dropped off now that it's moved to the Senate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you think it's inevitable. Although you never, yeah, this thing, I mean, he's going to get acquitted in the Senate. Uh, although you never know. I always, I always remind people he's just a, a Mike Pence is just one bad f- filet of fish sandwich away from being president. <laughs> It is true. Uh, I I, want to ask, before we move on to Pence, I want to ask one question about, Mm -hmm. because I just finished Robert Caro's book, Working, which was fantastic. Wow. You love it. Yes. Um, And so it's a lot about his writing process and and covering Robert Moses and LBJ. Um, when, When you sit down, where did you get the idea for the Pence book? And what is kind of the process of writing a book like this? Well, you know, um, (laughs) <laughs> when I was in Massachusetts, I also used to do uh, transportation research for uh, Governor Michael Dukakis. So he's a professor at Northeastern University. Transportation um, you know, for Michael Dukakis sounds like a wild time, Tom. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it. I'm not sure how many people would enjoy something like that. I had a good time looking at cost ridership um, estimates and the... Uh, and kind of in and which is which forms the backbone i can tell you right now that doing that red line in indianapolis not a very good idea because your your density don't, will never make up anything close to a, a normal fare box return right. um in there we could go deep if you like on, on transit and transportation <laughs> well, I, I didn't know you but like so so you're doing research and that's kind of where you started with research mm-hmm. right? I, yeah, and you know the funny thing is when I wrote that uh, that Tony Bennett investigation um, that uh, that Jeb Bush group uh, Chiefs for Change kind of like whatever did some investigating of me, which you know turned about as fair play, right? And um, and they were telling reporters that I had, I had worked on Mike Dukakis's uh, 1988 presidential campaign and he's a partisan hack. And I'm like, well, I mean, it did work for Dukakis, but I was also all of seven years old in 1988. Right. Right. <laughs> um, so I, but when I was working with him, he, I, I remember sitting with him in his office and he's got a very small corner office. It's actually not much bigger than this phone booth, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, um, and he introduced me to Robert Caro. Ah, okay. And he points to, which is all a very roundabout way to get back to your question. And he points to his bookshelf. And he says, he says, Tom, you know, in his Dukakis voice, he says, Tom, you ought to read The, the Power Broker by Robert Caro. I will tell you, that book blew my mind, uh, my little 23-year-old mind back then. When you're reading about, I mean, for the, I mean, it's, it is a tome. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the LBJ books here on road. But million, when, yeah, you cut it down from a million words to 700,000 words. But the, the gist of the book is essentially, you know, I, I got into <laughs> politics and I got into radio, the radio side of journalism and media, if you can call radio journalism. But it uh, is. <laughs> I got into it because I was an idealist and I, I had a very... I really thought that, wow, politics can make a difference, and I wanted to cover it, and I did, and I did that for four years with Abdul, and I watched Democrats and Republicans, and Mm -hmm. I basically saw the power broker in action, and I think it's a great illustration of local politics, which is why Caro wrote it, Uh, and it was, so is that something that actually inspired you to to write? Absolutely. Well, you know, I was reading it, and I mean, just the level of detail that he achieved in that book. And then, you know, he also talks about it. I think this is, he talks about it in his book, Working. No, but I'd, I'd read some other interviews with him before. I love Caro. I think he's just the, the epitome of, the, he is the pinnacle of good journalism. Um, yeah. Now, a little dense, a little hard to get through, but always worth it. Um, you know, one thing he talked about, I, I've experienced this with multiple um, politicians now, is that, Robert Moses, the subject of his book, the, uh, the man who basically created New York City, built New York City as we see it today, um, set up all these barriers to, um, to Robert Caro while he was working on the book, um, telling people not to talk with him, trying to block access to him and to, you know, his story, the story of his life. And, um, you know, I've seen that a lot throughout my career, but I also have seen what Caro did, which is that you can work around those barriers 
And eventually, if you, as you get more information, um, you knock down those barriers. And, and then you get access to more information. Good inf it's like money, right? Money gets money. Information gets information. Um, yeah. If you don't have any. Yeah, Penn State right? is really anti-press. And so did you experience any yeah. talks? Did you get to talk to Pence for this book at all? No, Pence will not talk with anybody for any book about him. Um, and I guess we're now it's remarkable now that we're on the, I guess this is the, the fourth book that's been written about him. Did you ever think there would be so many books written about Mike Pence? <laughs> would have dreamed of that many books. <laughs> um, he won't talk for profiles. He won't talk for books about him. Um, uh, Kate Brower uh, wrote a book about all the, all the vice presidents and um, she kind of got strung along by his office um, for a couple months where they're like, yeah, we'll do it. No, we won't. You know, they kept on delaying. Anyway, I, they told me a number of reasons why he won't talk. Um, but he did, Pence himself did cut loose certain people to talk with me. And um, I think that was, you can't, it's impossible to get a complete sense of him. Um, at least I, you know, I've been working on this, I guess, ostensibly since 2011, but in intensively since 2017. Um, I still feel like I don't completely understand him, but I have a pretty good sense of him. And, and he controlled that, you know, actually not unlike the way that um, uh, Robert Moses controlled access to himself um, mm -hmm. when Caro was writing. Um, my book is not nearly as long or nearly as in depth as Caro. <laughs> yeah, you can tell the people close to Pence talk to you for the book. You can't, re you don't reveal your sources, but you can kind of read between the lines a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Let me expose my bias about Mike Pence and my interactions with him just for the listener. Uh, and I won't ask you to do the same since you're an investigative journalist. But um, my interactions with Pence largely came in 2012 when I ran Rupert Bonham's gubernatorial campaign along with Evan McCain. Oh, wow. And, mm -hmm. so, you know, we were up close. My ex-wife's third grade teacher was Karen Pence. And so that, that kind of, we had a lot of great talks and we had a lot of interaction. I found Mike Pence and Karen to be very, very polite, nice people. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've always said on this program that Mike Pence says what he believes. He, he, if he, mm -hmm. says anything, he says what he believes, he's not the, the, the type of Christian conservative Republican that says one thing and then taps his foot in a stall. He's, He's a true believer, and I think that comes across in the book. But the other thing that, that I found about Mike Pence is that you had gone from Mitch Daniels, you know, and our audience is national, so it's not very local, so I'll try to catch the audience up here. But Mitch Daniels was a, a dynamic leader who had weekly Friday conversations with the press, mm -hmm. had very capable uh, press people, very friendly relations with the press. And then Mike Pence, you know, in 2013, I worked down, I worked with Brian Howie, who is a local mm -hmm. reporter and how he would tell me all the time. He goes, not only I probably shouldn't quote him, but uh, you know, it, you just get the <laughs> sense that their press people were very unwilling to talk to the press that kind of comes out. And yes. so they, they, Mike Pence just didn't really talk to people. And when they started just in, which was basically like a reformatted press release service, the press was just ready to pounce. And that didn't help him with riff or ether, which kind of killed his presidential chances. But when you were here, well, and you know, like what was and let me and, and let me just say this about the um, whatever that you know, just in the state run news service because it was a state run news service. You know, I remember, oh boy, end of January 2015. I'd gotten those documents a few weeks earlier, and um, and, and you know, we broke the story over at the Indy Star. Um, I'd reached out to Kara Brooks, who was the old spokesperson for, um, for Pence, former, was she RTV6? She used to be a TV reporter. She might've been RTV6, I can't remember. But she had been with him for a few years at that point. And they'd always been bad with us. They always waited until, they do what you see right now in, in DC, which is, you know, wait hours and hours to get back to you, um, or wait until the story posts and then get back to you and complain that they, you know, that they were, they were going to get back to you and then go on Twitter and say that, oh, this was so unfair. Um, now, you know, the, the flip side of that is that it is on us as journalists to give them time. Um, we can't be posting things immediately. And that's, that's, that's our own problem. Um, but at first I thought, well, you know, maybe they didn't get 
my my email in the morning and I, you know i knew there was some i wanted to give this some lead time because the documents were just astounding talking about creating editorial boards and, and you know having this you know, the state communications directors of state agencies being the line editors on this news service and i thought to myself well you know maybe they didn't like maybe they haven't heard from me and then one of my sources got back to me and they're like, yeah, they know about it. And they're starting to tell all the other reporters that they're going to have a big announcement tomorrow about this new press release service that they're creating called Just In. And they're asking everybody to sit on the story until then. And I was like, oh, so they do know about it and they just don't want to address it right now. Okay, that's how that is. <laughs> and sort of a hallmark of Pence's time as governor, he would not announce things until mm -hmm every duck in a row and he caught everybody by surprise which typically doesn't work well in indiana especially it's a very collegial state and i don't know what it's like in maryland mm -hmm. in it is a lot yeah of, and i don't mean this to sound like it's a cabal or it's nefarious you have a lot of people <laughs> in indiana who work together across aisles mm -hmm. and you even mention it in your book about the tony bennett investigation there's a gentleman's agreement on certain things mm -hmm. and and with Pence, he sort of took advantage of that a little bit. And and what you saw, he did. The governor, he was yeah. he was fairly for somebody who spent so long in the media and working with the media. He had a very uh, crazy notion of how to be governor, which was just keep everybody in the dark and then surprise them. Yes, yeah, and that's and you know I think you know when when after the, the book published, I figly enough the same day that. Nancy Pelosi announced there would be an impeachment inquiry. Um, so that was pretty stunning. Um, and a lot of people started asking me, they're like, oh, what would a Mike Pence presidency be like? I'm like, well, opaque. Um, it would kind of be the opposite of Trump, yeah. right? Like, I mean, we know it having been around him, having, having, you know, worked around him, having seen it. But I think in Washington in particular, there's kind of a, um, a, a misunderstanding that because Trump is incompetent, that therefore the vice president's operation must be completely competent, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, like in a Mitch Daniels sense, in a managerial sense, in a in political operative sense. Um, but they suffer from, and this, and everything goes back to the principal, the, the, the chief politician. Um, I used to think, I, I, earlier in my career, I used to think, I used to believe stories about rogue uh, staff you know, so they went rogue. Right. <laughs> um, the more I covered things, the more I came to see that the staff is often a reflection of the principal. Um, and Pence is, he sits on things for forever. Um, he does wait a very long time. Uh, when he has meetings with people, and this is not, I'm not just talking about the journalists here. I'm talking about other politicians, other, play, other players, Trump himself in the April... In April 2016, they go. Him and Chris Christie go to the governor's mansion and try to get Pence to not endorse inside um, in the uh, Indiana primary. And they walk out of that meeting convinced that he just told them that he was not going to endorse anybody in there. Ted Cruz's people were convinced that he had told them that he was he was going to endorse. Um, you know, uh, let me give you a more recent example. Um, uh, ambassador, uh, EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland told Mike Pence that um, that the, the the Ukrainian aid was being withheld in exchange for an investigation of Joe Biden and his family, and and Pence nods and does the you know the Pence right, he furrows the brow a little bit like Reagan kind of right, and um, and doesn't say anything. Well, did Pence just acknowledge that he that he had heard Sondland say that yes, this money is being withheld in in return for an investigation? I don't know. What does that nod mean, right? Does it mean yes or no? I mean, Pence's people said that no, he never heard that, and that Sondland made up the whole thing. The one thing I can tell you is that Pence is very good at at non answers, like better than any politician I've ever seen. And um, and and the and the other politicians, the people he works with behind the scenes, are the ones who get that too. So in that way, he's egalitarian, right? You know, journalists and the other and, um, and everyone else were all in the same boat, wondering what the heck is going on, in, you know, going on inside that guy's head. You saw this in the 2012 campaign when he when he ran. Like we were running against him, giving very specific policy points because as a libertarian campaign, people expect you to have none. Mm -hmm. 
Mike Pence took our vocational idea and actually implemented it, which is one of the benefits of LP candidates. Oh, um, yeah. What you saw is an absolute message machine. Mike Pence never yes. got off message. One time you mm-hmm. highlighted the book where someone is asking him the question the several times the same way he gives. And, and that 2012 campaign is a lot like uh, – it's like he had gone to Hollywood and had script writers write up like, here's what, <laughs> here's what, you know, we're all Hoosiers. Mm-hmm. And I believe Hoosiers are just the best. Mm-hmm. Your audiobook guy was great because he nailed the, the Pence the cadence and, and it, Oh, he was so funny. Added a great line to it. But what, what I have been struck with is Mike Pence's ability to never get off message. Mm-hmm. And, came back from Washington, D.C. to run for governor. He was a different guy. We'll talk about early Mike Pence later, but mm-hmm. the Mike Pence of today is somebody who is very closed off, very opaque, as you said, and very on message. And that has to be very frustrating for the press corps, but it also doesn't lend itself to good government. Well, that's right. And, you know, look, he changed. And I heard this from people that worked with him in radio in the 90s. You know, he went to Washington and he became a different person. Um, we all change as we get older, right? We all morph and um, fit different roles. Um, and you know, the thing I, the thing that I've noticed with him is that more than other people, um, he seems to go by the textbook definition of whatever that role is and then fit that role. So that's where I come up with the, you know, the chameleon theory, the, the shapeshifter. Right. Um, that's just kind of the way that he is. And I mean, is that, is that so stunning for a politician? I guess the, the, the discordance comes in when, when you know, all, every politician tells you that they are people of values and principles, and these imply fixed things. They imply you know, rock solid bedrock values and, and whatnot, when in reality, um, you know, most of those things are pretty fungible. Um, I'm thinking of um, the uh, uh, the trade, uh, his stance on free trade, for instance. Um, you know, <laughs> I was, uh, I got WIPB up in Muncie to digitize uh, the 2000 debate. Um, so they had the video on uh, on cassette. Um, but they, I got them to give me, send me down an MP4, so they digitized it, which is great. I mean, thank God, thank God for the uh, the universities, the libraries, you know, keeping a hold of this stuff for us because it is now part of history. Um, you know, it's part of how, Congress in 2000. Yeah, he ran for. I'm sorry, when he ran for Congress in 2000, and they got a copy of the debate that uh, that was between him, Bob Rock, and and Bill Fraser, and. Bill Fraser is one of the funniest characters I've ever seen in politics. This guy is hilarious. <laughs> the, the, the moderator, I forget who it is, the moderator asks a question. He says, all right, uh, gentlemen, you know, we're in Muncie. Um, a lot of manufacturing jobs are online here. Uh, what's your stance on NAFTA? And, um, and they go to Bob Rock, who's a Democrat, town manager of Anderson, Indiana, and Bob Rock says, well, you know, I agree with uh, my, my party, the Democrats, on almost everything, but this is an area where I disagree with them. I think we need to um, get rid of NAFTA. It's hurting jobs in, in Muncie. Okay. All right. Go to Bill Fraser. Bill Fraser used to be a Republican. Now he's running as an independent. And, um, and Bill Fraser, and they say, he, said, he, says, he says, you know, I remember when they passed NAFTA. And, and Fraser used to be a United Auto Worker and now he's a uh, farmer, um, he says, and he pull, reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a, a little pink way slip and uh, it's a little piece of paper and uh, he waves it in front of the camera. He says, they told me I was going to get more money for each bushel of corn that I sold. I just sold my, my bushels this morning. I sold them at a two cents a bushel loss. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and they go to Pence. <clears throat> and Pence gives them the the serious face, you know, Mike Mike Pence serious face. And basically the answer he gives is hashtag learn to code. He says, he says, now I'm, I'm certain that uh, the the good people of everywhere from Muncie, Indiana to Anderson to Shelbyville, all throughout the second district are ready to make the changes needed to compete in today's economy. 
with the leadership of good people like Mayor Dan Cannon, I know that uh, that everyone is ready to retool for the future. And so he gives the, you know, it was pretty standard, right? Pretty standard response in that moment. And they, were, and they go back to him and they say, well, okay, but you didn't really say whether you completely support NAFTA. And he's like, well, let me be clear. <laughs> Which always is followed by something <laughs> completely unclear. I know. The, well, the funny thing about that is the, the answer, because I think he, that's, a, that's an old line for him, but it changed over the years, because then he says something which is, just blew my mind. He says, he says, let me be clear, NAFTA is the only piece of policy I agree with on with the, President Bill Clinton. Direct answer. Direct. I couldn't believe it. I was more shocked that he gave a direct answer than <laughs> Yeah, so by and, the and, time, and, go ahead. Right? Yeah, so by the time he joins with Trump, he's, you know, he's uh, anti-free trade, um, you know, whatever, fair market or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what that is, but he was anti-NAFTA 16 years later. So I, I think you get a sense when he's basically auditioning for vice president. Um, mm -hmm. You maybe talk about the flat tire and how that helped him, but that wishy-washiness – was kind of annoying to Trump and was a big reason why he preferred Newt Gingrich or Chris Christie, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and let's, and, and, you know, let's be care, uh, clear here. Let me be clear. Um, <laughs> um, in that moment, let's, let's set this up. Let's, let's hop in the, the history machine here, the time machine, the time, the phone booth, all right, my, uh, my very own TARDIS. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, Understand that in that moment, uh, May, June 2016, into July 2016, no, nobody expected Donald Trump would win. Um, furthermore, they still viewed him as the Republican establishment still viewed him as a liability, not the nominee. Right. And lots of people were turning down Trump to, to join his ticket. He, they'd gone after people like uh, Oklahoma, former Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon. Um, Susanna Martinez, uh, I think she was the old New Mexico governor. They were looking for women. Um, they'd gone after moderate Republicans. Bob Corker uh, famously turns them down. And um, you didn't have exactly the pick of the litter um, by the time you, you really get down to it. So by July of 2016, there are three serious candidates. Um, Chris Christie, the New Jersey governor, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, former House Speaker, and Mike Pence. And Christie was pushing himself. Um, he had a close relationship directly with Donald Trump. He had gotten on the Trump train, eh, I want to say early. When I think of like getting on the Trump train early, I think of Jeff Sessions, right. who was for months and months was the only senator who supported Donald Trump. Um, but early enough that he, you know, Christie got had an in with them. Yeah, uh, Christie. Yeah. I was going to say Pence had quasi endorsed Cruz here in Indiana. But, <laughs> again, well, if you watching this, bit from <clears throat> off. well, right, and that goes back to that meeting they had, right, where they say right. that, right. So, Javanka, Jared and Ivanka liked Gingrich. Um, they hated Christie because uh, Christie, <clears throat> as a federal prosecutor, had helped prosecute Jared Kushner's father, um, Charles Kushner. And um, they liked Gingrich. They didn't really have a feeling one way or the other about Mike Pence because by July 13th of 2016, with, I mean, one week to go until the nomination, um, they'd never met him before, right. like that late in the vetting process. And Pence was being seriously vetted for a full month at that point. You know, one of my, as a reporter, you know, I mean, you know, this being in media, you're always trying to gauge who's telling you the truth, who's accurate, who has the best version of the truth. Um, uh, you know, what, what jibes uh, with a B, um, right? What, what, what connects? And, to me, the version of events, I've seen so many different versions of how he was selected for the ticket. The version that says that Mike Pence was not the leading candidate going into the week of July 13th, 2016, uh, but then becomes the leading candidate 
um, in that moment after the, the campaign plane pops and Trump is stranded in Indiana, in Indianapolis. Um, part of the reason that made sense to me was because I'd always heard the, the Kellyanne Conway version of events where they, she, you know, she says that the family really hit it off at Bedminster um, the, the weekend before, the 4th of July weekend, um, had a great, you know, great time out there, the Pence and the Trump family. Um, but a lot of Trump advisors uh, kept on telling me, they're like, come on, that's, you know, that's not the Trump family that makes the decisions. The Trump family that makes the de decisions is Javanka, mm -hmm. which is, and at that point, in that late in the game, they had not met Mike Pence. So really, it was a, it was a joust between Gingrich and Christie going into it. And then the campaign plane pops a flat tire and is stranded in Indianapolis. On a, and on that a, changes to everything. Yeah, the campaign stop and he was doing some fundraising and, and uh, mm -hmm. got stranded here. Mm -hmm. It's uh, July 12th, 2016. Gets stranded, forced to stay overnight. And um, the, the next morning, they uh, Jared Kushner and, um, and Ivanka and, and Donald Trump Jr. fly in first thing in the morning for breakfast at the governor's mansion. Um, that is their first time meeting Mike Pence in person. <clears throat> and, you know, I think I put this out there in the book for the first time. Pence was supposed to fly to Manhattan and meet with them alone Wednesday morning. So in, the, in an instant, it goes from Mike Pence going, have, supposing to have gone to Trump Tower to meet with Javanka alone, not with Trump. Trump was going to fly onto California and do a fundraiser um, to them being forced to fly to Mike Pence's home court. And it changes the dynamic. You know, um, the Trump advisors always talk about the site of uh, New Gingrich, um, uh, run, you know, running around the lobby of the uh, the conrad uh, haplessly and trying to find a trump and it it psychologically it emasculated him i had a lot of people tell me this that it, in that moment it emasculated him and then gingrich, and pence, was town, gingrich was in town the night that the plane got stuck here and so he's at the conrad well yeah, right yeah <clears throat> yeah he gets flown out there by sean hannity at the last minute Oh, uh, really? right. And it's yeah. It yeah. He gets flown out there at the last minute because he was fighting for the vice presidency. Is that why he was flown? Yeah. In? OK. Yes. One hundred percent. Christie played too cool for school and said that he wasn't going to fly out there. Uh, but he was but he was, you know, still calling Trump all the time. Um, Pence. This is something I learned about Pence in the process of writing this book and something I did not appreciate before. Um, he's got some chops. He's got some political chops, some serious political chops. Um, and when he needs to, uh, he knows when to leverage a situation. And that's exactly what he did in on Wednesday, July 13th, 2016. They're sitting in the bunker in the basement of the governor's mansion. Yeah, it's a bunker, but it's not really a bunker. It's a, it's, you know, a furnished basement. Uh, <laughs> they have a lot of meetings down there. And, um, and Pence and Trump are sitting on couches, op you know, opposite each other. And they have the brass tacks talk. And, and Trump looks at him and he says, he says, he says, Mike, I need a killer. Are you going to be a killer? I need a killer. He says, look at, look, he pulls out his phone. He waves it around. He's like, look at, look at this. Christie's calling me all the time. That guy is a killer. Are you going to be a killer? And Pence looks at him and he says, I'm not a killer. <laughs> I, that's not me. Um, you know, if you need a killer, go find a killer. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm going to win re-election. And they probably were going to re win re-election at that moment. That They were pretty certain of that. Um, he says, you know, look, I'll help you lobby. I'll help you raise money. I'll help you in the Midwest. I'll help you with evangelical voters. I'll help you with conservatives. Um, but I don't need this. I really don't. And, um, you know, I'm happy being governor. Um, author, side note, I'm not entirely sure. I believe that part of it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but that calm response just shocked Trump. Because Trump was so used to people kowtowing to him between Christie and Gingrich, 
at that point. And he couldn't believe it. You know, and the, he kind of viewed Pence as a loser because his intel, intel, which was very DC heavy, um, was that Pence was going to lose re-election. So in his mind, here's this guy who was in, in, his, in his mind a loser. And so Trump hits back at him. He says, he says, he says, why don't you want this? He says, look at Christie's calling me right now. He's like, everyone else wants this. Why don't you want it? And then Pence gets this like you know, that, that wry Irish humor. He says, he says, well, Mr. Trump, you are sitting here in my house on, on my couch and your entire family flew out here. So obviously the feeling must be mutual. <laughs> Why do you want me? And Trump was just astounded, just yeah. astounded. And I was, uh, and to, to highlight one of the things that I took away is just his ambition and how lifelong that ambition has been is as they were vetting him, uh, Trump was astounded and turned off by the fact that there wasn't anything. Big. He thought that maybe they were hiding something as what I sort of <laughs> away from the book is that this guy mm -hmm. cannot be this clean. And what you, what you learn about Mike Pence through this book, which I didn't know a lot about Mike Pence pre 2012, to be honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew he had done some talk radio, but I didn't know he started at the radio station down the hall from where I currently work and had, had gone to <laughs> WIBC and, uh, had been a week a weekend talk show host, weekend uh, TV host, and he was. Mm -hmm. all, it, it just seems like, and I think you captured it perfectly um, in one single line in the book. Steady Mike Pence didn't have to usurp Donald Trump to become president. This was after the uh, Access Hollywood tape. He was well on mm -hmm. his way to winning the Oval Office by playing a cunning long game by exercising his yes. Herculean discipline, and I think. Maybe talk a little bit about Mike Pence's lifelong cunning uh, long game by exercising discipline and getting to the moment where he is one bad filet fish from the, the White House. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, look, the um, Access Hollywood weekend, um, they had an opportunity to knock Trump off the, off the ticket. Access Hollywood, October 2016. Um, when the famous Trump, you know, quote, I hate saying this, but, you know, when Trump says that you can. Yeah, right, exactly. I know. Respectable <laughs> journalist. I'll say it for you. I'm so shocked. No. <laughs> Anyone who knows my salty language knows that. No. <laughs> I shouldn't be shocked by that, but still, it's still pretty stunning. Um, I guess, can I be honest with you? Yeah. I was so shocked by that, less by the language, but more by what he was describing i've never heard of anyone even doing that i just i don't locker room talk man come on yeah right i know it's a weird locker room i, I don't understand i don't know I've, I've got a lot of locker room talk and a lot of whatever but um anyway that's a profoundly I, embarrassing moment and mike pence was you know had a chance and karen was reportedly pretty disgusted by it but you know, here's a guy who is in, I mean, he had a, if he had pushed, he A, would have lost Trump, you know, and mm -hmm. Trump, Trump appreciated the fact that he went and did a fundraiser for him right after. But it was mm -hmm. sort of, after that point, a lot of us here in Indiana went, like, this guy's the real deal, legitimate Christian crusader, and he's sticking by Trump. Mm -hmm. Like, it was a very mm -hmm. confusing thing that he would choose. Why do you think he, why do you well, think because he's vice president? He's not a Christian crusader. It's subordinate. It's subordinate to the ambition. Hmm. Um, and that to me was, and I think that's one of the things that really pissed off the Pence people the most. Um, but based on everything I've seen throughout his career, there is a moment where his ambition overtakes his, um, his faith as a driving force. Um, I actually don't think it's when uh, Trump selects him. I think it really starts in 2008 when um, the national conservatives start trying to recruit him to run for president. Um, and so I think it starts earlier than that. And it's not like an immediate thing. It's not like a flash of lightning. Um, it's gradual over time. And I think Trump was just um, the, the final embodiment of that. Um, but, you know, let me go back to that Access Hollywood weekend for a second there, because it just kind of gives you a sense of their calculations and why they're treating things the way they are. Um, at the same time that had been going on, uh, Pence's chief fundraiser had been going around trying to line up donors for Pence's 
run for president in 2020. So Pence had joined the ticket in 2016. Why in the heck is he lining up donors to run for 2020? Because Trump was going to lose. And when Trump lost, then the starting gun fired for the 2020 race. And they were, they, that's, what they, that's why they signed up for that ticket, because here, here's God giving them a chance to run for president in 2020, which is something that they had been working on since, hard, you know, seriously since 2008, since the end of 2008. Um, when that didn't happen and when Trump law or when Trump won, they, they effectively lost, right? It pushes out their window of running for president. Um, what are you going to do? It's the long game. It's the presidency. It's not, you know, it's not running for Congress. It's not running for city council. Um, you, you stick it out, you wait, and also acknowledge that that's that the party has changed fundamentally. The party had shifted from um, sort of a, 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 a Bill Crystal style um, of, uh, I guess, erudite conservatism to um, more of the Patrick Buchanan, Pat Buchanan populist raging conservatism. Um, you know, was Trump the first one to do that? Of course not. No, I mean, like, you know, Sarah Palin. I, it, to me, it's amazing that nobody talks about Sarah Palin anymore, but like she grabbed that all right, in, you know, in the moment, there's a great straw poll where the Tony Perkins Family Research Council, Christian Wright later, um, gets together, you know, Christian Wright Family Values or Value, Values Voter Summit, that's what it is. And um, they have a straw poll and Pence wins the straw poll um, in 2010, beating out uh, Sarah Palin. And one of the reporters asked uh, Perkins and says, well, geez, Palin is so popular. You know, why did everyone vote for uh, Pence over Pence? Palin and Perkins, and this is so apropos of Trump, um, Perkins says, well, you know, sometimes we're thinking things and we, we ought not say them out loud. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And his shift, Pence's shift on Trump has mirrored a lot of the evangelical leaders and the, the Franklin Grahams. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, as an evangelical Christian myself, and I, I, was sort of stunned as a Hoosier from the south side of Indianapolis with uh, talk radio past and Christian evangelical roots. I go down, I, I live around the corner from the Bob Evans where he switched churches. I, you know, like, <laughs> I'm surprised at how much he and I had in common. Uh, I went to Ichthus myself and, and had a great time. Wow. Um, I did not go to Vespers though, but you know, he, um, <laughs> he, he sort of embodies that shift and I look at these guys and I just go, have you lost your mind? Like how, I think if you, if you seed, this is my personal opinion. When you, when you chase political power first, you sort of lose your standing as a Christian. Uh, do you think as a Christian leader, but do you think that mm -hmm. Rif Rifra, I think was incredibly damaging. That was the, yeah, basically the restoration freedom act here in Indiana where, you know, it was, he was governor. I was shocked and you may come back to this or you can hi highlight a little more, but I, I always knew he was using this as a stepping stone for, to run for president. I was shocked at how deeply involved in running for president mm -hmm. he was when he was governor, including mm -hmm. not trying to steal Iowan businesses uh, for Indiana. Yes. I mean, he was yes. derelict in his duty in a lot of ways because of his ambition for president. But mm -hmm. when he, when he uh, signed the RIFRA bill, which was sort of, Mitch Daniels was always very careful about telling the Republicans in the state, stay away from social issues. And so I think Pence, yes. he had to give it, give a nod of the cap to the, to the Riddler. Mm -hmm. And that, I, it seemed to me in the book that he was profoundly affected by becoming the poster child for hating gay people and i don't think that he hates yes gay people. talk about the book where his daughter gets married and has a gay best friend as a as a in the wedding i don't mm -hmm. think that, but how much do you think that him giving up he, he wants to almost shed some of that christian conservative value and, and the trump thing helps with that it's like yeah i'm a christian but i'm a republican first almost anymore well Boy, I mean, a lot to a lot to get into there. There's a lot there. So let me clarify. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, was there a giving up of like he he had for so long tried to embody the Christian right? After Rifra, 
do you think he saw that as a losing cause? Well, <clears throat> you can gauge Mike Pence um, based on his ambition. The one, the one constant is his ambition. And how do we know that? Because when he ran for governor, he ditched all talk of abortion and gay marriage. So things that had defined him previously as a, you know, quote unquote, Christian crusader on the right, um, on the, the, the Christian right, um, when he was in Congress, now he just drops them entirely. Um, he goes back to it, uh, sort of, with RIFRA. Um, but, you know, here's something I report for the first time in the book, um, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, it was surprising when the more I understood that, he, to me, it surprised me how much he was running for president when he was governor. I just, I didn't, I couldn't see it when I was at the state house. And maybe that's because I was inside the wrong bubble. You know, I think the people in the, the reporters in DC who were, um, you know, being coaxed along by his, by his staff out here in DC saw a very different version of Mike Pence. And I think maybe they saw more of that presidential run. I think that's why it's good for all of us to, you know, get out of our bubbles and um, and then try to, uh, as you know, try to experience more of the world, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, I could not, I could not appreciate or see how much of that prior to this, prior to that, prior to learning about that. However, however, I guess I was not surprised when I found out that the reason that he signed the, the quote unquote fix, they backed down on RIFRA, they backed away from the Christian right stance on all this, was because a, a, a big mega donor named Paul Singer, whose son is gay, uh, calls him up and tells him that he won't give him any money if he's gonna run for president unless he signs the fix and backs down. So when given the option of siding with the Christian right or siding with a Republican mega donor, he picks the mega donor. That, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and now Singer, of course, is, as as your guys, you know, your your listeners will 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 remember, ultimately becomes a Marco Rubio backer and supports the with the the found the foundations of the Steele dossier. Now he does not, you know, originally with I think it was the Washington Free Beacon. He puts a lot of money into them. And he's kind of like the Never Trump Republicans. Then all, of course the Democrats pick it up after that, and the Clinton campaign picks it up. And um, that's when they recruit Steele, um, you know, the foundations of, some, not the foundation, but some of the foundations of the, the whole Trump-Russia saga. Um, but, and I should point out too, the Singer's people flatly deny this ever happened. Although my source was in a position where, one, I trust that source. Um, other things they've told me panned out. How does there, you know, one of my favorite questions I get as a reporter, I get, I got this from my neighbor. He's a, um, he used to work for um, a watchdog um, in uh, one of the one of the agencies uh, out here in D.C. So a very smart dude. Um, uh, huge. He's a huge fan of One American Network. Um, um, and um, he uh, he asked me once, he's like, how do you know it's real? And I'll tell you in an, a sort of an epistemological sense, I don't. Because you never know. I don't actually know what people are telling me is real. Right. How do I know that something Trump tweeted is real versus how do I know that something Barack Obama tweeted is real? I mean, were you there in the room? I think of that, it, you remember that Chappelle skit where he made fun of R. Kelly and he's like, he was talking about like all the different ways that like, you know, all the different people that need to be in the room to witness R. Kelly abusing a minor in order to prove to a court that it was real, right. you know? And he's like, he's like, oh yeah, and R. Kelly's grandmama had to be there too to witness it. And she has to testify under oath that she witnessed it. So like in, an, in a very sort of existential sense, eh, no, I don't, I mean, can you ever be 100% certain? No, it's impossible. However, when sources tell you stuff and it checks out, over time you develop trust in those sources. And this source in particular told me a lot of stuff over the course of some time that turned out to be accurate the, the, to the best of my knowledge. And, you know, you get a pretty good sense of when people are denying something because their ass is on the line and, you know, they're, they're kind of frightened. And I, I get that. 
I understand that. Um, yeah, I had that thought during the conversation earlier where you're talking about Trump and Pence sitting together in the basement of the, I mean, is it, and I'm not going to ask about that specific thing, but just the craft in general. I mean, do you, do you have one person that tells you something and then you verify it with other people based on, you know, Pence walks out or Trump walks out and they tell three people what happened in the room and then one of them tells you something and then you can double check that with other people. Like how, how does that, it, it is my sense of that correct? I mean, that's always yeah. how it worked. Yeah, right. Exactly. Somebody's you play like, yeah, it's kind of like you play information ping pong. Okay. All right. So, right. So like, you know, the balls, the, inf the information is the ball, right. Then you got batted around a little bit and you see what, what you're actually dealing with. Um, for the VP selection, I will tell you that, um, and this is something that Caro does. I mean, Caro is incredible. Um, I try to see where the different groups are. And you know this from being in politics that, you know, there are different factions, right? Um, right. Even, you know, inside. What blew my mind is that inside Pence's world, one of the smallest political operations I've ever seen, one of the tightest political operations I've ever seen, there are even factions inside of that. <laughs> There's like... Right. You know, like, and there's like, it's like survivor, you know, there's like people supporting, sometimes they're supporting Bill Smith and Kelly and Conway and other times they flip sides and, you know, it depends upon which season we're in. And so do they <laughs> like almost like a vengeance thing. Like I'm going to tell Lo Bianco at the AP this thing. So I'm going to give him a tip or is it more like, <laughs> I got a few of those. I got a, yeah, I got a few of those. It like happens. Why, maybe, like, why does somebody choose to leak information to the press or sit down and tell you what they told you for a book like this? Well, sometimes they, I mean, look, sometimes it's a multitude of reasons. So let me, I'll rewind a second. The, what you try to do is you try to go to as many different factions as possible. And you also need to know who would actually have visibility into something, you know, who was in the room. That's why it's so important. And that's something I had to learn later in my career. That's why it's so important to ask who was in the room for the meeting, because you're trying to create a sense of visibility, because there's all kinds of people who were never in the room for a meeting who will tell you all kinds of crap about what may or may not have gone on in there. So you're trying to establish, you know, first eyewitness, um, you know, reliability as sources. Um, it, you know, to your, so your, sec, your second part of that question, the, the next what the question was, I'm sorry, repeat that again. But essentially, you know, why are some of the reasons that people will talk to somebody yes. about yes. or a story? Oh, this was great. Um, I was really impressed by the people who reached out to me. I mean, let me, let me put it this way. I reached out to them extensively, and then they opened up to me eventually. This took a long time. I was very impressed by the ones who were clearly trying to protect Mike Pence. Hmm. Um, you know, as a former political staffer myself, to a degree, not I only did it for two years, but, you know, still something. I respect the concept of protecting the principle. Um, you know, you're a team. It's, um, and I guess I was unimpressed by the people who were only talking with me only to protect themselves. Hmm. Um, you know, that's kind of the former political staffer guy in right. me thinking that way as a journalist you know if it turns out to be real i'll take it however i can get it right? right if it turns out to be not real i would prefer not to take it and i can tell you that there's a lot of crap that i've heard that is not real and um you know you learn not to trust those sources yeah well, um, that's i think one thing that people don't understand about journalists is that there is you know uh, I've worked on the political side. I've worked on the media side. I know a lot of, of journalists have done both like yourself. Like they're, you know, whenever I'm around Rupert, I just fall right into staffer mode. I start, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Glasses off his head. I, you know, like there, there is, um, I think, I think respect is kind of what you're, what you're detailing there. There, there is, mm -hmm. is why I think Trump drives journalists crazy is that, he, he's breaking down the respect that journalists and, and the re working relationship that journalists and politicians, mm -hmm. it's a symbiotic relationship. And what you just described is that yeah. you, you want to respect somebody that you're covering. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah. Well, and to the question of why are people telling me things, you know, I was kind of surprised by the different reasons I kind of plucked out of it. Um, you know, protecting Mike Pence versus not protecting versus protecting themselves. Um, sometimes people were telling me things to hurt Mike Pence. Um, you know, um, his political opponents. That, that's not surprising. We, you know, what you really want is you want a mix of all of them, right? It's just because somebody hates a, 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 a political opponent or is, you know, trying to get them, you know, trying to crush them. It doesn't mean the information is inaccurate. Probably usually means that it's been embellished a good bit. Um, but if you can remove the embellishment and try to get to the kernel of truth in there, um, then usually you have some pretty, pretty good information. And, you know, what do I do as a reporter? Okay, so somebody tells me that, um, you know, look, the Kellyanne Conway version of how Pence was selected, they had a really good, um, they, the Pence family and the Trump family hit it off real well at Bedminster when they were golfing and they connected at a family level. And that's kind of the, he's a good Christian. Uh, Trump is really a good Christian too. He's atoned for his sins. Kind of like the, that is the official version of events. Um, and then you go to, you talk to people who are in different positions and you say, okay, is this what happened? And they're like, well, no. Does that seem like the family that, you know, makes, that calls the shots for the Trumps? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, what family are we talking about? And they're like, it was, Baron, it was Baron Trump and Melania Trump were on the golf course. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, well, we were with Jared and Ivanka. <laughs> and they're like, not there because they hadn't met Pence because that was not a priority. So um, it's just that you hear the same things so many times that that it, it, the most common thread is how you determine what the truth might be. Well, and I'll tell you this: I think I, th I think the thing that really kind of um, is kind of flummoxing for uh, for reporters and dealing with Trump's operatives versus traditional political operatives. You know, classically, um, if somebody did not either did not know something or knew what you had to be true, um, they would never lie to you. I mean, that's the difference between lying and spinning. Spinning is, um, you know, uh, the, the, the press secretary tells you, um, well, that was not the right meeting. And you're like, oh, well, okay, you just told me no, but you also said that it's not the right meeting. What was the right meeting? And sometimes you can get them to give you a little bit of information. Um, but, and it's in, they know that they have credibility at stake. And for most of these people, they know that they, they will have a career later down the road. Um, I mean, I think we all kind of think that way. And what is your calling card? Your calling card is your credibility. Right. Um, what's so strange with Trump is sort of the nihilism of it. It's just that stuff doesn't check out and they just make shit up. Um, right. I've, I've never, jeez, oh, it is really, it is astounding. It, is, it continues to be astounding. Um, I guess, you know, the nice thing about that, one of the reasons I really enjoyed working on the Pence book was because when you, when you deal with Pence's people, look, they're opaque, it's maddening. Um, they're really hard to work with and impress stuff. They don't give you a lot of stuff, but they don't lie to you. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I deeply appreciate that. Yeah, he seems to surround himself with good people. I mean, all the people that I mm -hmm. know work from are, are great people. Like he, and he genuinely cared about the staffers that mm -hmm. were on that campaign and their longtime staffers. He's maybe talk a little bit about his loyalty to his people, but because this is one of the criticisms of Pence, the governor, and maybe as president if you ever were elected. His loyal, he's almost loyal to a fault. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, we always heard they kept around people they shouldn't have kept around and created problems. But the people like him, he's it wasn't an ideologically diverse. He'd come off of Mitch Daniels, who hired a Democrat to be the Commerce Secretary, Mickey Mauer, and then mm. Pence rolls in, and it's like white Christian. It looked like a Sunday school to Baptist church in Southern Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that, that's you know part of that problem and i think this is really to me this is really amusing um <laughs> when when mitch was leaving office everyone asked about like the mitch daniels legacy project you know hey who's putting together the legacy project uh because he was kind of a larger than life figure 
And, um, and his people always denied it. Oh, there's no legacy project. Nobody's working on actually putting together a legacy project. You know, one of the things I found inside that Tony Bennett, uh, the emails, was a meeting about the legacy project for Mitch Daniels. <laughs> there was a legacy project. I, I laughed because it's like, of course there's a legacy project. The guy was in there for eight years. He reshaped Indiana. You know, it's a, right. you, you, you should do a legacy project, capital L legacy. But as part of that feeling, you know, he raised up a, a generation of Republican operatives um, and brought in a lot of people into the party um, that might not have been there otherwise. Uh, you know, you mentioned Mickey Maurer, for instance. Um, uh, the Daniel staff, generally speaking, hated the Penn staff. Really? Yeah, and you know, I think it was—I think it was kind of mutual. There's just a general disdain amongst what's the staff. The, what's the disconnection? Because he's talking about two Republican governors. I mean, what's the disconnection between the two camps? C- sibling rivalry. Okay. Really, is sibling sibling rivalry. I'll tell you a a, um, a great story from when I was covering uh, Maryland. So this is actually before I started covering the Maryland State House, um, but, but as part of the reason I, that I wanted to cover state politics. Um, I saw the same thing happen in Annapolis, in the Maryland capital. Um, uh, <laughs> the former governor, William Donald Schaefer, um, legendary character, he's, he, he forms part of the basis for the mayoral character in The Wire, uh, Tommy Carcetti. Okay. Um, um, he was mayor of Baltimore, then he's the, the governor, um, and he was like a, he was a powerful force in Maryland politics the same way that Luger was in Indiana. And I think for a lot of people who are younger who didn't see Luger in action, they don't realize that Luger and Keith Buellen created a political machine um, out of nothing almost and kind of made, Repu- made Republican politics what it is today in Mitch, Indiana. Mitch Daniels was Dick Luger's chief of staff when he was mayor here in Indiana. Exactly. You know, exactly. Line, basically. Eric Holcomb was to Mitch Daniels what Mitch Daniels was to Luger, Holcomb's now yes. gone. Yes, yes, 100%. Um, so Schaefer was that kind of figure in Maryland politics. Um, he leaves, he's term limited, and he leaves after two terms as governor. Um, and the guy who follows him is a guy named Paris Glendening, who's a political science professor. Um, you know, just a different flavor. It's like the difference between Evan By and Frank Bannon, mm-hmm. right? Uh, he's sort of... Uh, it's just a different, and you also saw the sibling rivalry between the staffs of Bayan and O'Bannon, um, which is kind of very fascinating. Um, so rather than leave office, Schaefer, he doesn't totally leave office. He runs for a different office. He runs for the state tax collector, it's the state comptroller, and, um, and he wins. And so throughout the term of the new governor, like Schaefer can't let, he can't hand over the keys to the to the to the capital he just can't do it so throughout the throughout the eight years that they're in there together the former governor and the and the current governor they have um these bi-weekly meetings bi-monthly meetings uh called the board of public works where they approve capital projects um you know university extensions uh new playgrounds shit like that um and Paris Glendening has been cheating on his wife with his deputy chief of staff, a woman named Jennifer. And um, the Washington Post is doing a major investigation of this. This is a, this is a great reporting. <clears throat> they, 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 they have rented a, um, an apartment across the street from the hotel where they were banging. And they would watch them. They would spend all, they would stay up. They, they would get up, they'd stay there, and they would watch them go in together. They watched them leave, leave the, 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 the hotel together. Um, it was incredible. They had the story nailed. They had, they had uh, Glenn Denning dead to rights. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> everyone kind of knows this because, you know, it's getting out around town. <clears throat> so in one of these Board of Public Works meetings, um, there, we have a drought. There's a drought in Maryland. So um, Paris Glenn Denning kind of hates William Donald Schaefer, and he orders this fountain at the governor's residence turned off as a symbolic as a symbolic thing to make sure that you know everyone's getting you know taking being serious about the drought all right you know save water 
well, that was William Donald Schaefer's favorite fountain when he was governor, and he takes it as a slight. So Schaefer gets back at him, uh, you know, one of these meetings, and one of the university people gets up there and says, you know, ask for money, and um, and before Glenn Denning can answer, Schaefer looks straight across the room and at Glenn Denning's mistress, Jennifer, and says, I don't know, why don't you ask the boss? <laughs> and everybody turns their head, and looks straight at her, and everyone's like, oh, <laughs> you can like, you can feel the air leave the room. <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead. It was incredible. You know, now there's there's a case of two principals hating each other, right, of, of, of a rivalry, intra-party, both Democrats, obviously, in Maryland. Um, my, my, and, um, my friend Robert Vane says this all the time. He says, what, what people need to understand is that you expect a Democrat to stab you in the back if you're a Republican. You mm -hmm. don't expect a Republican to stab the Republican in the back. And so inter-party fights are the most brutal. Mm -hmm. I still... To this day, seven, eight years after the fact, there are some people in the Libertarian Party of Indiana that hate me more than they hate any Republican or Democrat. <laughs> you know, right. it's, just, it, it's just there's something about inter-party rivalries that, that are just incredibly severe. So that leads me to the question yeah. of Trump. So there are a lot of similarities between Trump and Pence. You know, the, the, con the last person that they talk to is what they go with, uh, you know, the – sort of nobody knows what you're talking about. I think the talk radio connection, the fact that Pence was a talk radio guy and Trump is basically every talk radio mm -hmm. I've ever talked to as president. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a ton of striking differences as we've outlined. What is their relationship like now, if you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's warm, professional, but aloof. Mm. Um, and you know that's not that's not entirely strange for a vice president. Um, I think you know prior to that, our two examples are Joe Biden and Dick Cheney, and I think those are sort of um, I guess you can call them sort of outliers in the in the modern vice presidency, right? Um, you know this, the idea of this like romance between um, Biden and Obama, um, and then and then Dick Cheney, who was actually the shadow president. You know, I saw one of the books was called on Pence was called called him the shadow president, and I kind of laughed. I'm like, well, that's not accurate. Um, <laughs> I mean, that implies that he's secretly running the show. Does it look like Mike Pence is secretly running the show in the White House? Right. <laughs> no, he's, I mean the answer. Yeah, exactly. The answer is no. He's not actually secretly running. He has a hand in things. He is a sphere of influence, but he's not the only one. It's not like he has Trump on, you know, these marionette strings, um, you know, look, the relationship is, um, it's warm. They're very nice together in person. Um, they do communicate routinely. Um, I wouldn't call it close. Uh, you know, one of the stories I reported out, um, last year for, uh, for Yahoo news, um, was about Jared and Ivanka uh, Trump talking about getting rid of Pence, and maybe maybe replacing with Nikki Haley. Well, I think a lot of people misunderstand that somehow because they're talking about replacing Pence, that automatically means Nikki Haley. There was a list of people. There's more. There's more names. I never got the actual names, but there were other women that were being considered. Um, so Jared and Ivanka and Brad Parscale, the Trump campaign manager have their own sort of, you know, whatever, tight-knit cabal, right? Their group, right? They are the political leadership of Trump world. Um, they sidelined Mark Lauder and Marty Oaks, who is, or Mike Pence's political operatives. Um, what happened to Nick Ayers? Well, uh, Karen Pence, according to my, my sources, didn't really like Nick. Um, and a lot of people thought that Nick was spending too much time managing up and not enough time supporting Mike Pence. Guess what? That turned out to be pretty accurate. Um, he was trying to become the White House Chief of Staff. Guess who wanted him to be White House Chief of Staff? Javanka. Javanka had been grooming him to be White House Chief of Staff. Um, you know, did Kellyanne. Did he turn it down or did he just not get picked? Well, he, he, he turned it down, which is okay. very weird. But remember this. 
Kellyanne Conway, one of the sharpest political operators I've ever seen. If you want to, you want to learn how to use a butterfly knife in politics, much. <laughs> I mean, it's like you, you'd almost never see it if you didn't know where to look. Um, she helped kill uh, Nick Ayers' chances at becoming the White House chief of staff. How'd she do it? By overexposing him. Hmm. By putting out more story, by helping to, to buttress stories about him being the guaranteed next pick as White House chief of staff. So basically boxing him into the decision in public before he's ever had a chance to even weigh it out one way or the other. And what's going to happen? Well, he's going to lose the money from his vendors, from his consultants. Um, and he, he, the overexposure was what did it. That was the final piece. Yeah, there's the seeds of their fight. Go back to the RIFRA and them are arguing mm-hmm. for some things which you outline in the book. So that that is a question that I get asked a lot by friends. Like, do you think Mike Pence will be on the ticket in 2020? My gut yeah, says, he will. Like, you think he will be on the ticket? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, we're, they're not going to drop him. I mean, it's too one. It's too late at this point. Um, it's I, I spent a lot of time researching this um, for that Yahoo story and then and for some additional reporting. Um, it's too late. It's I mean, the ballot mechanics are underway. He's already submitted his name with, look, when, when he went up to New Hampshire, you know, Corey Pence goes up to New Hampshire and Corey Lewandowski's there with him and they're at the, with Bill Gardner, the Secretary of State's office. And it's a big photo op, right? He's filing the paperwork for Trump's reelection. And everyone, and like the kind of the scuttlebutt, the chatter out there is like, oh, this isn't really about the Trump reelection. It's about Mike Pence running for president in 2024. Well, yeah, that is a, a, a sub story to that. That is certainly, it's not just one story that's happening. There's multiple stories and that, that is one of them. Um, and that's something that Pence people don't mind having out there. Um, but the third part of that, the even deeper part of that was that was Pence killing all the rumors that he's not going to be the VP because once they are entangled legally, it is hard. It is hard to detangle them, disentangle, whatever you want to say. Um, and, and he's on the ballot legally with Trump now. Yeah, now that it's it's been filed in the states, and each one of those states locks him in even tighter. I don't think they're going to drop him from the ticket. What what kind of chances do you think Mike Pence? I mean, I think after reading this book, there's no doubt he will run for president. But what do you think yes. his chances might be in ever seeing the Oval Office being president himself? Uh, better than I expected before. Um, you know, I kind of wrote him off, um, based on his, um, his performance, uh, especially as governor and, um, you know, his limited performance in the white house. Um, but that's not, you know, your performance as executive, as administrator, whatever, is not what determines whether you become president. It's your performance in the world of politics. And he's very good at that. He's very good at the inside game. He's better at it than a lot of other politicians I've seen. Um, I, you know, he has a charisma deficit for sure. Um, and this people acknowledge that and he's got to overcome that if he, if he wants to actually win the White House in his own right, it's certainly in a general election. But I think he's got a, big, a better leg up inside the Republican Party than most people understand. I mean, remember that Nikki Haley was never Trump before she was pro-Trump. Pence never took a side. Right. He kind of did a wishy-washy Ted Cruz endorsement. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is a, a great narrative in the book, too. I, I want to I ask one final question before we go to the obligatory self-promotion. Um, you know, we probably should have done this early on, but I thought uh, I wanted to touch on his first two congressional races. And basically, they're, t- yeah. you know, those two races and then his mea culpa sort of afterwards, um, kind of those first two congressional races back in the 90s, I think they were 90s or late 80s, were very Trumpian, including yeah. some anti-Muslim yeah. rhetoric. Yes, uh, and, and yes, I, how 100%. Much are, can you talk about those? Do you think that is deep down Mike Pence, and now he's just learned to be quiet instead of saying out loud what he, who he truly is? Well, it wasn't just Trumpy. It was Gingrichy. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's, and, and, and there's a reason for that. 
look, the official version of the events on the Mike Pence biography, um, you know, the public version of events that people have put out there was that, um, that Pence ran a very positive campaign in 1988, came very close, and then he became negative all of a sudden in 1990 and ran a terrible anti-Muslim ad, and then he lost by 20 points because he became negative. And then he writes an essay apologizing for it and saying that he'll never go negative ever again. Um, that's the public version of events. I can tell you that it's, that's largely wrong hmm. um, because he, was, he ran a very negative campaign in 1988, not a positive campaign, a negative campaign in 1988. And part of the reason I know that is because he, as I was doing the research for this, um, your Indiana listeners will know uh, who Paul Ogden is. Paul Ogden went to law school with, uh, with Mike Pence, right. and they both fly out to campaign school in 1987 in Washington, D.C. Who's running the campaign school that they're going to? Newt Gingrich and Joe Gaylord, his chief political aide. Um, when they're out there, I talked with Joe Gaylord for this. This is fascinating. He says, Mike Pence read, he says that Mike Pence read my book and told me it was great. So obviously I loved him. And so I went and found a copy of that book. It's called Flying Upside Down. This was the go pack training manual for a generation of conservative Republicans. And ultimately it's what leads a lot of these folks in the, in the Gingrich revolution. I mean, that seems like, like antiquities now in 1994, but that's where Pence starts in politics. His first run is informed by Newt Gingrich. Um, I went up to the Phil Sharp archives the, up at Ball State University. He ran, he ran against Phil Sharp, the Democrat, the incumbent. Um, and I'm looking at these mailers that they were that they had put out. You know, one of the mailers says, "What's you know, what is what is Phil Sharp's record on uh, on drugs and criminals?" And then on the back, it shows a picture of a lines of coke and says, "It's weak." You know, a couple <laughs> crack rocks over on the side. <laughs> You know, just shit like that. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's like, it's pretty negative, right? You know, it's like, there's this guy's going to flood the streets with a, you know, a whole bunch of, whole bunch of drug dealers and they're going to kill you, right? Like, yeah, it's pretty nasty. I mean, it's not like, that's not, I, th I think it's also par for the course. Um, but so he started from that point. He started from a negative Newt Gingrich style attack campaign, which is, guess what? That's what challengers often have to do. You got to get some attention. That's how you roll. All right. If you're running as an incumbent, you can be nice because you already got the prize and now you're just trying to hold on to it. It's, things are easier. Um, so by 1990, he keeps running the same style of campaign, of nasty negative campaigning, but more so. And, you know, the thing that really kills him in that race was that they had to use the campaign cash to make, pay his personal expenses. That's what really killed him. And then by the end of it, he throws up a Hail Mary, which is this ad that he comes up with where, you know, the oil prices are up and, uh, and he's going to have, have somebody dress up as an Arab oil sheik. Um, you know, it looks like something out of Rock the Casbah, the, the old music video. <laughs> and he's going to have like, you know, with like the gold, the gold rings on his fingers and the, you know, the gold necklaces and all this, and the, the kafia, the hat, the, the scarf, the, you know, um, and, and, and tunic and whatnot. And, and, and the signature of this, this is because Mike Pence is a very big fan of Saturday Night Live. And he's going to put a little humor into this, okay? Uh, <laughs> the signature of this is going to be that that uh, halfway through the skit, so he'll be thanking this guy, this Arab oil sheik, will be thanking Phil Sharp. Oh, thank you, Phil Sharp, for sending so much money to my people from your people. <laughs> and then halfway through the spot, he's going to lift off his aviator sunglasses, and underneath will be another pair of sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy gold from our vice president. Comedy gold. Comedy gold. Um, you know, it was, it was, it, you know, it, it, it blew up in his face. And it was the Hail Mary that they tossed up in October. And it didn't, it didn't work, obviously. Um, you know, he does apologize in the, in the next year. You know, what's funny about that is that it wasn't just an essay that he wrote. He penned an entire book proposal hmm. around that. The, there is a book proposal of this. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah, because, but it really was like him trying to. He had he had basically ticked off all the big donors here in the state, and so he felt I got mm -hmm. to do something to cover my butt. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, he ticked people off. 
Um, and he, he was trying to cover his, you know, his took us. Um, but it, he also, <clears throat> I think it was Pat Traub, the old Indy star, uh, uh, reporter asked him, he goes on like a media tour saying that he's apologizing. It kind of reminds me of like when Glenn Beck went on a media tour after Trump got elected and apologized for being Glenn Beck, you know, <laughs> right. and now he's back to being Glenn Beck. <laughs> um, he goes on this media tour and, and Pat Traub asks him, he says, well, have you called up Phil Sharp to apologize to him since this was such a nasty negative attack on him? And Penn says, well, no, why would I? Right. And he says, well, because this is an apology to him. He says, well, no, no, no. This is not an apology to him. This is me confessing and saying that I will never do this again, but it is not an apology to Phil Sharp. That sort of underhanded, like he does publicly, he does the right thing, but privately he does the wrong thing that you normally, like if you're trying to be a good person who is living out Christian values, you wouldn't treat Phil Sharp that way. You wouldn't treat Chris Christie the way that he treated him. Like, like there's, mm -hmm. there's just a lot about Mike Pence where you're just like, I don't know if it is insecurity or if it is, you know, being a former fat kid myself, I sort of know that avoidance. Mm -hmm conflict and but he i don't know it's it's he's a very interesting character much more than than i expected and i really liked the book and i rec i highly recommend it because we didn't even scratch the surface in a lot of this and i think it is a great example of how somebody rises up from obscurity of their debate team on on high school up through the ranks <laughs> to become president. i think it's a good outline he's an interesting case study and uh, you've captured it pretty well um, so where can people buy the book and tell us where to follow you and shameless self-promotion time? Oh, thank you. Thank you. The, the name of the book is Piety and Power, P-I-E-T-Y and Power, Mike Pence and the Taking of the White House. It is a complete biography of the vice president. Uh, it is available on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. If you have a local bookseller you'd like to go to, I used to like to go to Half Price Books, a shameless plug for Half Price. Um, out the indie and uh, you can go to indiebound.org that will give you your local bookseller books a million also and um, you can find me my name is tom lobianco that's l-o capital b as in boy i-a-n-c-o on twitter got a fancy new website that was just put up because the last time i worked on my website was 10 years ago and i didn't realize that it had been 10 years ago um so <laughs> <laughs> now, and uh, last time I worked on my website, I was a blogger and I didn't have, you know, I could just blog, blog, blog. And now you need professionals. So I hired one. <laughs> very good. Well, it's uh, congratulations on the book. It's very good. Uh, I Thank like I, said, I listen, I enjoy the audiobook version. So audible too. don't forget that. Um, the guy does a great impression of Pence and Trump. And, <laughs> he <of course>. does. <laughs> Not just in a, he, you can tell he's like, he reads it very well. So that's, that's how I consumed it. Um, so thank you for joining me, and I really do appreciate your time and uh, hope everybody goes out and buys the book. And uh, he has a huge bump in sales from our audience because it's really worth your time. So thank you for thank joining you. me. Thank you, man. Thank you very much, Chris. That was awesome. Appreciate it. All right, let's stop this.